going to have our crunch later. That's going to be from Sundogs. Sundogs is the third novel in a trilogy. The first two novels were the Nusia and Mercury Station. All three were published by Semyon Text. Um, this is the book that just came out. And after Mark's reading, uh, he and Chris Krauss will have a conversation about the book. Rich in mammal life and birds, 
and become a key engine of the bubbles, an anti-bubble really, induced artificial stabilization atmosphere. Q's Q signed a little tease against her dorsal by first entrance. That would be Quinian's quill to the dolphins, and showed this was indeed the tendril she sought. As Deary pumped, looped, and turned through the horrid mouth soft with dancing weed, it might have been into the ancient jaw of a mega megalodon she swam. Beam ribbed by ghostly green light radiating from core, the water here was thick with life. She smiled, inhaling plankton. Life occurred vertically on the lush skeleton interior of the tendril. Porcelain crabs disrupted resting menton shrimp, cones of whose eyes contributed to the precision of her own aquatic vision. Their sideways scurrying sent out little clouds of sediment. Deary herself plucked at heavy oysters proudly footing into the crannies of ancient moon rock. She so rarely came so far from cove. Perhaps she'd find a pearl. This water tasted of the big, high, deep currents outside. It tasted clean. She bow shot vertically upward. I am not so sure of the sweetness all the same, she thought, thinking of Flynn O'Brien. She was soaking in more than usual of the energy that would one day kill her. Death was part of life and had been inscribed by the founders into all of the bubble's denizens. She gathered fins and pivoted, full swifting in a spiral faster and faster. Deary felt full fish. Less than a kilometer away from outer core, itself only one click from the zero G point occupied by the bubbles, Hatsumaki Mark V minutes mini sun, which is true. Salinity varied seasonally. The hydro systems evenly maintained variations in temperature were in an internal cold war between layers. Passage between strata could become a highly complicated affair. The hydrocene, where colder, darker waters dominated outside tendril, was recommended off-limits to gardener-gatherers like Deary. With fin-like appendages, Deary understood movement almost as intuitively as a fish. Still, she wouldn't want to have to face a hungry predator hunting the tendril. That's one reason Chouts wanted the dog, rising somberly somewhere still far below, along for this swimabout. A real live Owen guard looked and acted apparently lazy, but that was strategy. In ocean battles, surprise was everything. Owen guards were likely to handle anything they were liable to meet in Quinian's quill. Deary's brother Doug, currently swimming point for Cove, prickled at the notion of the solitary guardsman accompanying her. The dull, squiddy independence rankled Doug. It rankled everyone. But even Doug had to admit the doll was up to the task of defense, should defense be needed. Of course, Deary knew the doll by now in a way everyone else did not. In the library, long talks had left the two of them up often late into the night. He signed so beautifully with those tendrils. If he was grumpy, he had humor. And frankly, she found his strange body so repellent that it was somehow attractive, fascinating. Unfortunately, since she'd made clear the sleeping arrangements last night, he'd fallen into a foul mood. Already, Deary had found herself tiring of his in inexorable logic, tending to deeper and deeper negativity. She came to stasis with a sudden intuition, all flukes breaking in the midst of a school of self-entranced hippocampi who didn't even scatter so smooth was the arrival. Yes, intuition had been correct. She tipped and flexed, peering through the weed-lined armature of the tendril, already tasting sweet water. Here was, particularly, here was a particularly grand air hole, just where Chouts had intimated, intimated, intimated it would be not an hour's rise from Van. Hurry up, doll, she signed, though he was too far back to see. Deary outstretched her arms, lifted her silky flukes, inviting the seahorse to feed. Mermaid is right, the doll was thinking, slow pumping rhythmically fathoms below. She knew why he was on the swim about. It was not because it was his duty to swim fin for Deary, Dr. Barnhart. She knew what was between them, yet she avoided it when at all possible always fleeing ahead when he inquired as to the purpose of this swim about. Despite yesterday's great hopes, that moment to be distinguished by the wrapping of her flutes around his svelte and compacted, still virgin torso, seemed further away than ever. Yet why would she take swim about now and accept his company if it were not to play and practice at breeding? Did she know the doll was reproductively active? Did she even think of him in that way at all? The doll still wasn't sure, he very much wanted to be persuaded she did, 
He himself had immediately offered to Finn when she told him her plans. He'd been surprised as everybody when she emerged from conference with Doug and signed the doll as Finn. She had to have argued for him with determination, the doll knew. The vote came and the matter was approved. Had she explained what she was up to, to Doug in that air hole? She didn't have to. Swim about was everyone's right. It could be two weeks or it could be a year. Finn permitted if approved by community. Perhaps that was the point of her swim about, to get the doll away from Cove. Despite the smallness of Doug and all he represented, the doll quite liked Cove. Solitude and natural splendor were, were available daily in every direction and possible variety. In Cove, he was never bored. Braved with carefully chosen implants, the doll had the poets great and small at the tip of every tendril. The doll was a natural day signer. It's like a daydreamer. The Cove Clay farmed and maintained a swath of the tropical thermocline, a relatively peaceful region above which the staggering gradients of the open high deeps began. There were no tendrils by Cove, just undulating meadows atop studding coral beds for kilometers in all the four directions. Below began the grand architecture and tropical warmth of core. Above stretched the high deeps. There were air caverns all about under. There were hot bowls, sweet water pools, various chemical streams and ponds and always new nooks and crannies to discover. During his time at Cove, the doll had hunted cod, mackerel, and salmon. Easy stuff on the whole. Predators stayed in the higher strata, usually kept away by gradient barriers of temperature, salinity, and pressure. Twice he joined in the community hunt of a whale on, ex on an expedition high up in the deeps. He'd come in useful then. Late in the summer, a renegade self-propelled barnacle appeared. That thing from the shadows, as Hiram still referred to it dramatically. The doll managed to lasso the monster's extraordinarily long penis and fix it in a vine trap before Doug could arrive to rescue it. Some nights later, a clade of nomads came in pursuit of the thing. They said as far as anyone knew, the barnacle was the only one of its kind, a freak life form peculiar to the bubble. The barnacle was without extra organ impotent and alone, yet it had a central nervous system and near impenetrable defense, and was often suddenly jetting about with inflexible will. An essential Owen life form, the nomads had argued, and the doll had agreed, impregnably, impregnably pointless. So let us be. After a week's visit, the nomads signed farewell. Pulling reins, they let the barnacle take them away, straining. Owen guards could come and go as they pleased. Though he made himself useful to all, the doll stayed in Cove because of Deary. A relatively peaceful and agricultural life, most fishermen in Cove believed the Owen Guard more symbolic than necessary. The adults were all quite eager to send him away on swim about, he noted. Only Doug interrupted a unanimous vote. How coldly Doug had signed with his whiskers, abstain. Doug was already put out by Deary's swim about, but the doll as Finner doubled it down. They were all uniformly bewailing the loss of Deary. It was perhaps natural. After all, it was still less than a year that the doll had come from East South Pole. He was the second stranger in their midst since founding, and it was one of the reasons he stayed, to teach them of the other. Deary understood right away. The doll and Deary were friends, and both particularly avid readers, though he of poetry and she of fiction. Indeed, he wondered now if it were only because she was code librarian and he its most dedicated reader that she'd take him along on her personal journey into self and destiny. Still, though he admired her love of books, he found her taste still blunt and unsharpened by experience. Think of 20th century crime novels, he remembered her signing very seriously. Those old earth titles that hoard themselves most cheaply stood ultimately as a more realistic window on late capitalism than any of the highbrow attempts to secure meaning despite it. Um, are you talking about Raymond Chandler? Ugh, no. Was her silvery glow always to be obscured by frantic signing on the relation of primitive narrative prose to dead economic systems? The doll sighed carefully when she presented her opinions, admitting no certain signs. Why did he find her so attractive? Even when arguing nonsense, Deary came across as a persona of clear and almost infinite fineness. But damn it, the doll didn't believe in capitalism. The term was a sham, a bogeyman abstraction covering up a multitude of individual crimes. 
he didn't believe in it and certainly didn't want to chase that ghost now out here where it had been exhumed. Only poetry gave up that defunct mode of masking consumption. Fact, a fisherman in Oa's bubble had more to glean from the poetic tradition, stretching back as it does to the Cro-Magnon Neanderthal hunter-gatherers from first freedom than from the potboilers, romances, and penny dreadfuls typed up to valorize various strands of late capitalist, quote unquote, delusion and fantasy. Perhaps in the claim's nearest core, or on East South Pole where labor approached leisure, one could still take legitimate pleasure from escapist ventures into cartoon cities and arbitrary nationalist realisms miraculously sparing the protagonist at all costs. But out on the stream, hardly. Was that, was that 15 minutes? <laughs> <laughs> it goes on from there. Okay. Obviously, there have been many 
science fiction great books um, that use a poetic style, um, mostly, but they haven't been so popular since the 70s. And um, yeah, I've been more of a tradition. And this main character, the doll of this, he's obsessed with poetry through most of the book. Okay, right. they're hilarious together. I mean, it's so funny. It's so funny. But, okay, to the script. Okay, that was the unplanned. <laughs>
I did not know it would be the first series in, in books. Um, it took a long time in coming because when I wrote Benizia, I transferred from trying to write mainstream or I don't know, maybe not mainstream, but uh, non science fiction, just fiction, regular fiction. Um, so it was my first major attempt to go science fiction wise. So, in that way, it was. Um, kind of a discovery, a book of discovery of what I might do as a writer that I hadn't done before. Um, uh, when I was writing the book, I was living in Los Angeles, and I had this little shack in a beautiful little garden where I could work in. And I used to see Venus all the time, and I think my idea, I think when I was writing it, um, I wasn't quite sure at first it was on Venus. Uh, but this star really was calling for me, and um, I don't know, I got into Venus, and uh, <laughs> the problem is that anyone who has a modicum of scientific knowledge about our solar system has been told that Venus is the least possible of all planets for a human settlement, literally. Which, all, which struck me as rather odd, because it's also the closest to Earth, and it's a possible Earth twin. Uh, it just seemed odd that it would be so extremely hostile to human life that I thought perhaps there was something there telling our robot probes that information. <laughs> that was one of the founding ideas of it. And, uh, but it still remains since then. Uh, I mean, the Soviets dropped you know, a, a probe on Venus in the 70s and took photographs of the surface. And there are no, there's no ocean. There's no uh, plant life or anything. It, uh, how could I write science fiction on Venus now? It's sort of why the series had to take shape. And it's why they, folks go back in time. Each one shows how this future history could be created into a kind of alternate reality where Venus was a place humans could leave Earth as refugees and settle. Yeah, so, you know, a little bit, a little bit. Um, the, um, what you're saying because it was
but Earth was, in the meantime, almost in that effort, destroyed itself. And it is collapsing totally. And the question is, will these colonies that have been in space now for, uh, I think, less than 100 years by the time the sun is starting, Will they survive the collapse of Earth itself? And so each book finds a different colony and traces out its, its possible survival. Um, so, okay, last night in the bar, we were talking about Owen. Um, Owen, you mentioned that in the little after yeah. that you learned, and it's one of the many of that could pick up in your books. Owen is like the ocean, and you were saying it's against the concept of the other. Well, it's yeah. like you talk about against capitalism in this book, against the concept of the Anthropocene. Uh, yeah, I mean, I didn't know, I had never heard of that term when I was writing it until, I mean, I only heard it recently, I guess in the last year or so. I don't know, but um, uh, OA is the, in all the books, it's sort of this, there's a kind of um, intergenerational time traveling revolution happening and the service of OA against its enemies, or OA sometimes pronounced it. It's not quite clear what it is, and in this book it becomes clearer than ever. And uh, yes, it has to do with the ocean in a way, the Earth's ocean, where, where um, our life came from. And so uh, the idea of OA and that these characters believe in, in the future it's not something I would plan to talk about. I kind of write cheesy fiction so I can talk about it there, you know, but since she asked me. Um, uh, yes, it is, it's an idea of Earth life as a whole, uh, not as separating into humans being anything different than trees that support them and give them air and the bacteria that are in them and make them walk around, etc. So you can't, the concept of Oa is a whole. If there's no idea of the anthro anthropos as a separate entity to this philosophy in the future, um, and so on Venus, the plants themselves and Venusia give give you a really clear sense that they see humans as a project of their own that went wrong. That plants helped humans develop our brains with mushrooms, etc. Uh, and uh, in order to get plant life back offered on rockets. And they didn't plan it, they didn't go, etc. But there is no separation between species. This is sort of the idea of oh, I think that's one idea way of looking at it. Mirky's diction is that under the end of a penal colony, actually a hostel, a juvenile detention center, where one youth named Eddie Ryan has been left behind. Eddie's Irish, and there's all these allusions to the history of the Irish Republican Army. His only chance for escape is through time travel, and he ends up in the high middle ages, taking for the mud. Yes, I mean, sort of he, his, his mind prints are, are cast into a dying young girl's body who's being executed as a witch in the middle ages. And as she dies, she literally gets hit by light and any Ryan's mind patterns take over her body. Um, and she, he can't quite remember what he is in the, or she is in the book. And, uh, but years later, in this prison, where everyone else has abandoned him, Eddie Ryan finds a copy of a book by her. Yeah. I'm doing it. Yeah. Yeah, that's, yeah. <laughs> so it's an idea that, again, that books are the only way of time travel. Talking about dipping into fantasy genre, which if you're kind of looking at young adult literature, like fantasy is the girl wing, and right. sci-fi speculative fiction is more the kind of boy wing. You know, uh, the girl wing being the Middle Ages and the rainbows and the unicorns. And you were well, doing as it's whole, marketed. I mean, at the time you were talking about doing a whole digression into like writing fantasy literature and yeah. the style of it. I did write something separately from the system series a little bit. Starlight was this fantasy attempt. But uh, yeah, I think all my work had, is sort of, I mean, it's science fiction, yeah, but it's also science fantasy, or, or well, one, one reason is it has, it's intended for as much women readers as male readers. And uh, I, the first uh, convention I went to some years ago, they were 
literally saying at the science fiction convention, you know, the average science fiction book sells maybe a thousand copies today. The average fantasy sells 10,000. So um, I, I was like, well, I should put some more fantasy. <laughs> I sell like 1,200 1, or I don't know. <laughs> but, um, yeah. Your books have thousands of references and allusions to things in the culture, but it seems to me that each of the books is ghosting a master book. Like in Venusia, I think of um, 1984 and Winston Smith discovering, you know, the secret text that explains how everything came to be. And in Mercury Station, it's more like William Gibson. The book that he finds is like the Joseph Cornell box floating around the galaxy in Mona Lisa Overdrive. In Sundogs, what I pick up on is the 20th century pulp fiction genre style. And you're a huge reader. You gave me piles of these amazing paperbacks, and I'm still making my way through. Um, who do you go closer to, Raymond Chandler or Dashiell Hunt? <laughs> Definitely Dashiell Hammett. Uh, well, I can actually have a lecture, if you haven't heard it, called Against Raymond Chandler. <laughs> he, you know, everyone, he's so beloved by our culture, he's just accepted because he's an incredibly great stylist, Chandler. But, but he, he is sort of um, the beginning of this American crime fiction. In my, I also write literary theory. So in, in my work, I claim that American cult fiction of a certain era had a, a kind of a incredible revolutionary, at least paperback revolutionary potential, and uh, um, that something happened to that, that tradition. And one of the things was Raymond Chandler, he sort of took this incredible um, American novel that was arising and transformed it into a kind of reactionary story of a perfect detective uh, who he said, down these mean streets, a man must go who is not me. And it's a man who is not me. It's the beginning of this of horrible, reductive tropes of American suspense and violent stories where the detective is a sort of fascist like Batman or in these movies today. Hammond, in, in his first book, Red Harvest, implicates his detective with, with the violence. I think he solved the, the murder on page 20 and he just stays around to get revenge. Uh, and then all sorts of bad things happen, so. Right. Yeah. Yeah, right, all bad. yeah, and also, by the way, Hammond was a committed socialist who was basically arrested, put in jail for him, not naming names that he didn't even know. He just did it for his um, pride and for who weren't supposed to. And he caught diseases he never wrote again and uh, he was put in jail. And Chandler was didn't write a book till he was something about my age. And before then, he was a CEO of oil companies that everyone failed uh, during the Depression. He was just like a horrible CEO. And uh, when the Great Depression happened, he looked at Hammond and just sort of stole the idea and transformed the whole genre. That's my stuff in my lecture. So. <laughs> okay, that question. Um, Who's Sterling? Who you served as a librarian when you were both working at Art Center, recently complained no one imagined the 22nd century. And this is understandable because the future goes closer and closer. A lot of the things you described 10 years ago in Venice, on speculative fiction have become everyday objects. The eye that allows people to see and record at the same time as Google Glass, and the lung protectors, the LP, they bear a strong resemblance to e -cigs. In Sundance, a colony of spacers have created a pioneer colony separate from Earth. Since the space elevator was blown up in 2133, the Owen bubble has essentially given up hope on anything surviving beyond its skin. How close are the spacers to us? Um, I'm not sure who us even is anymore, but I live in Germany now, but I'm just, I recently was at a um, uh, a conference about cyberpunk at USC, uh, where uh, my friend Claire was speaking. And uh, I really noted that people are so dismal about culture here, and rather hopeless. Even the cyberpunk writers themselves, the classics, like Bruce Sterling was there, 
Rudy Rucker, they they see, uh, you know, they're, I think they're half ashamed that their books helped make this world we live in cool. You know, uh, um, even they are unhappy with how technology occurs today in our world, etc. So maybe, I think that I, I have said critically, you know, I'm tired of everyone always saying science fiction is really about the present. Because to me, it's usually about the future. I mean, that's one thing that basically <laughs> defines it. But um, in this case, I must say that uh, I didn't think when I was writing these all oh, oh, bubble people, I didn't think about it, but I do think that uh, we are quite in this place. We go on in a kind of idea of our own little paradise in our little bubble, instead <laughs> of so cornball, sadly. But, uh, but uh, in fact, outside, our bubbles, there's really nothing anymore. It's just like this image a lot of our culture is carrying around of itself. I mean, I don't know if that's true, but it seems that way to a lot of us. And uh, maybe some dogs will, will be on bubble will resonate. But what happens in the story is that they're, they're trying to hide as well, because they know that the surviving corporations of Earth, if they find this incredible water world that's hidden away in the arena system, um, that they will exploit it, eat all the fish, you know, destroy the place in, in within years or within months. So they're discovered in the story, and, and they have to try to keep that news from spreading. That's sort of the plot. Okay. Well, I think we'll postpone the question of dogs until the next conversation. Good. Um, thank you. Thank you, Chris. You guys know this is Chris Brown, uh, the author. I don't know if you were properly introduced. Uh, I should be interviewing her. Sometimes things go upside down. Yeah, this is really good. Um, maybe if you want like that.